evening people. Sorry, it's the uh, later than advertised start. Sounds like Ahmed's had a good day. So let's uh, let's get him in and hear all about it. We're going to chat about some posterior cases. Um, if you've got questions, um, hopefully we'll get them in pretty quick. AJ Dentistry first in. Feels a bit weird doing this after a couple of weeks off. How we're doing? Everyone coming in quick. That's good. All got the message. Hey, straight in. Hey. How you doing, mate? You're right. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> to be late. Uh, it just happens. One of those days, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> how you doing, man? You can, you can yeah, relax you. now. This is a nice, enjoyable experience to do. Now uh, how's my hair here. look? Is it okay? Oh, beautiful. Better than mine. I'm, I'm, due another, I'm due another lockdown trip, I think. <laughs> oh, that's good. Let me just pop these up. Yeah, so we're, we're going to chat through what, two, three, three sort of cases. The main things we had were um, we had some good questions, and we're going to sort of base a couple of cases around those, aren't we? Um, yeah. And then are you happy for people just to throw in questions in the comments yeah. and the Q&A as we go along and do a, yeah, yeah. No you know, the Dr. Tadby Masterclass, yeah? Yeah, I wouldn't go that far, mate. <laughs> Not just, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, let's do it. I mean, just while um, we're setting up, obviously, it's sort of half and half and stuff. So, like, um, you know, do you want to just give everyone my followers who maybe don't know who you are Andrea. a bit of an intro and go from there? Ciao. <laughs> Chirag. Oh, nice. Theo, ciao, oh. ciao. We've got some good people on. Someone wants to yeah, join in the Bill's chat. Bill's on. Oh, I've got Bill. Isn't Bill it your bedtime, mate? It's about 4 a.m. It's about yeah, 4 a.m. He did say he was going to pop on by. He's keen, yeah. <laughs> So, do you want to yeah. just give everyone a little intro about yourself for anyone who doesn't? We've got two people trying to join the chat as well. We're not doing that. Uh, uh, yeah, a little so, intro about yourself and go from there. Yeah, so Ahmed, um, as most of my friends will know me as Samir. It's my middle name. I graduated from the University of Birmingham in 2014. Um, been working in mixed practice for the last seven years. And then recently left the NHS and fully private now. Yeah, how's that been? You were, you were nervy on it. How's it gone? Uh, it's, it's been good. It's, I was quite nervous about it, yeah. Um, it's, it's something new to me. Uh, and I was put off by it a few times. A um, few of my, like, uh, colleagues or bosses were like, you can't leave bread and butter, dentistry, and things mm -hmm. like that. But, the only thing I realized is, is, is stale bread, man. <laughs> There's no butter or bread. Yeah. <laughs> and the right decision, you think, for you? Uh, for the dentistry that I want to do, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. What, what I was finding, and I'm sure a lot of like, our colleagues are going through the same things, is that you end up, taking the hit yourself if you really want to do the right work or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you have to cut corners which isn't gonna happen with myself you know and it was just like being the first one in last one out every single day for the seven it just wasn't worth it and then you're out of pocket most of the time because you're paying for lab bills that you shouldn't have to or buying materials you shouldn't have to or instruments you shouldn't have to it, things like that which I didn't mind at the time, but it was just, an, it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't for the future. Yeah. 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 And the right opportunities came along. How's it going down the road in Fulham? Going all right? Yeah. Great. Um, it's I need been to amazing. pop by, man. Really? Pop by. It looks fun. It looks fun. We've fab. had so many dentists coming to see us and it's like, uh, it's nice. It's very nice. It's very complimentary. At pressure, the same right? time, it's just more <laughs> pressure. <laughs> And, and and some of them don't tell you they're dentists. They're sitting there and they're like, yeah, my upper lateral palatally, I have this. And you're like, hold on a second, you just said palatally. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is. I know, I'll just come for a, a chit chat on my day off on the walking around the corner. It's just, uh, I won't be coming to uh, trick you into a, into a traffic <laughs> I know your face, mate. <laughs> I'll show you a uh, fake mustache yeah, and a yeah, beard and glasses. Yeah. Um, so do you want to jump into the sort of the questions? I mean, we had those three main ones that you liked. Um, I guess yeah, one of them is a little man. bit. Any so the, fir the, the first one we had was, um, 
And yeah, this is quite an interesting one. Like how best to matrix a tooth when it's the one you have to clamp as well, you know, uh, you know, seven, that mm. kind of thing. You know, what's, have you got any sort of tips? Have you got a case for that? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, fortunately, I don't see many, but when I do, I think <laughs> it's, it's mainly a uh, clamp selection. Um, I've gone from clamp, uh, wing clamps to wingless now and okay. I find them so much better in terms of getting matrices on yeah everything you you've got more um sort of to see because there's not a lot of metal in the way they grip the teeth in my opinion better as well um and then if you do have a case where it's a distal of an, a last standing tooth mm. then um what what I tend to do is I I will have the matrix sorted out. And for these, I would use a Toflamir probably mm -hmm. um, within a mate, within another sectional. And yeah. then um, I'll get my nurse or assistant to help me um, sort of have everything in place and then unlock the clamp, get the band in, put it in, then put the clamp back on. And it's like, it's not an easy thing to do, but the more you do it, the easier it will get. I, I don't think I do. I remember you asked me about that. And I was saying yeah. to you, when we have those cases, as you know, the last thing you want to think about is taking a picture of it. Because <laughs> yeah. all you care about is the isolation at the time. So yeah. I don't think I have a picture of that, actually. I'm sorry. Oh. I may do in the archives, but <laughs> I couldn't find anything last minute. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's one trick. Have you um, tried those sling ones? I, can't, I think they're, yeah, they're really, I've, I've seen those around, and we've got yes. some in the practice. I've never, yes, yes, I've yes. never tried. They're really them. good. I was mm. coming on to those now, actually. Um, the other thing is those slingy kind of. Uh, I've got them in my box. I forgot what they're called. But I bought them from Incidental. I was going to say they're Incidental. Aren't um, they? Yeah, this thing here, mm. and. Um, it's also the kind of thing you see it on and saddle it looks metal so simple. Matrices, saddle. That's what yeah. they're called. Saddle matrix. They're amazing uh, for that stuff. But again, it's fiddly. Mm. So if it's a distal, I'd say if it's a distal, just use a standard Toflamir. Um, and then if, it, if, the, if the margin is too out, use Careful. a Careful, it's incidental have just joined and they've said saddles, so they're watching. Yeah, which. saddles. <laughs> I, I've just said it myself. But if not, otherwise use... Um, a top limit and place a sectional matrix in it and then you can use teflon to pack between the top limit and the sectional matrix to sort of contour however you like basically mm -hmm. um, and that that's usually the, the best trick um or just take the tooth out <laughs> <Don't think so. laughs> well i think that's uh, that was the next one i know you sort of put it in your story you had that very deep distal cavity uh, and that is one of the oh, other yeah. questions as well, getting good margins here. And you, you put it to a poll of uh, XLA oh, yeah. or treat. And what was, the, what was the verdict there? What were people saying? Uh, it was 50-50, you know. There's some brave people out there, especially the young VTs. Uh, they're all saving <laughs> teeth, which is great, you know. It means that dentistry is moving forward nowadays. Uh, we'll, we'll jump onto that case in a second to answer that question. Um, yeah. John Marco, uh, I'm hoping he's still on, my main man, John Marco. He's popped in and just said, when we were talking about the private side of it, so are you finding more people just wanting retail dentistry and private practice? Or are you still able to do families for checkups and recalls and things yeah. like that? I there, think it there are. There depends, are. doesn't it? It depends what kind of practice you're in. Like I, I still do yeah. a lot of a lot of family dentistry, um, and but that's more because I sort of I was sort of partly brought in to do that. Actually, I enjoy I enjoy peas and things like that. Uh, I do both ends of the spectrum. I do the the dentures and the peas. Um, but you know, so it, you, I think if you look for it, you'll still find it. And so, if you want yeah. to do your uh, family checkups, you can find it. Yeah, I, and, and it still is. It, it, it depends on what, what your practice, where you are where, working as well, mm -hmm. and what kind of demographic you're in. But I do find that those who have stuck with me now that I've made the transformation, they've, they've also bought their kids and stuff. And I like it because I want to just do normal dentistry where it's just a checkup a few bite wings, fluoride, mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. I don't want to sit there like now. Like this afternoon. To, and do... you know, <laughs> sit for two hours because 
I had to Uber some crowns, you know, and things like that. It, it just, yeah. yeah. You want a bit I of a like balance. You don't want a full on day. Density. You don't want a check up day. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, and the yeah. family and the kids, that's it's your practice builder as well. When you're transitioning over yeah. into it, you need that list building, don't you need that sort of capability. Yeah. Um, do you want to jump into that case? Was that was it from this morning? Was it? Oh, do you want to go? I, I can yeah. show you a similar one to this morning, but um, I, I can show you this morning's one as well. You're, you're saving this morning for content down the line. Is, <laughs> it, is it tomorrow's <laughs> post? <laughs> no, no. So, yeah, so not, this is one of our other questions as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's good marginal seal on a deep mesial, deep distal box. Okay. So yeah, we've got something like this. I have a few. I have a few. Yeah, let's go through them all, man. Uh, I can show you this one. So this this one I did quite a while back, actually. Uh, I think this was Go about away, four years ago. Keep it keep it vertical. Is that okay? Vertical? Yeah, yeah just keep it vertical. Is that, is that it okay? doesn't rotate. Yeah, that's perfect. Now. So um, I had this case on a lower left seven where we had some um, apical pathology, quite deep uh, GIC um was placed and i think the patient was told um to come back but they moved or they traveled away and then they yeah. saw me because they were in pain so these things i always try to assess the x-ray first and clinically so i'll have a look at the x-ray and then what i do is i use a probe and i probe around all the deep areas to see if I have any pocketing, any pass, things like that, that usually may indicate something like a fracture or something more sinister where mm -hmm. there's no point trying to save the tooth. If I'm happy then, I'll obviously tell the patient that we need to do surgery here or we may need to do some laser or we may need to use a blade and basically access to that part of the tooth because i'll show them the picture i'll say because look if you see here you can see the gums growing over um the tooth is underneath there's still decay there or potentially um and for us to do a successful root canal we need to have mm -hmm. a successful closure of the tooth first if i can't do that i can't save the tooth and yeah, you need the foundations are... to build on all that kind of exactly stuff. exactly so um I'll do this before I do the rubber dam or anything else. Um, now, th this is quite old, but now what I, I like to do, and it's something I've picked up from the Italians um, who do it quite a lot, is they will do surgery with a blade. They'll peel off the gums, do any um, bone contouring or removal, and then they'll place the dam on the tooth. Mm -hmm. which is what I did today in today's case that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Whereas this one, I think I was trying to be a hero and you'll see in a minute what happened. So I managed to get the dam on, uh, but you can see how much fluid is still seeping through. And again, this was in my, my earlier dam years, so it's not perfect. But what I tried to do then is using a matrix um, I placed the matrix and then I just flooded everything with um, the polydentia. What is it called? It's oh, like the, endo, the, the endo seals. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. But anyways, you can see how, how much I was struggling like at the time. But I did get good moisture control. The wall was built. Mm. And then I did my root canal and whatever. Again, you can tell this was old because I was using Thermophil back then. Horrible stuff. Never again. <laughs> yeah. And then that was the composite direct. I think it was like, because the, as I said, the patient wasn't someone who was a regular attender. So mm -hmm. I didn't really want to risk it with putting a GIC or a temporary. I just went for a direct, made sure that the remaining cusp walls were good enough or the remaining tooth tissue was strong enough and I think that that will hold out quite well so that's a case where it was quite old um, four years ago but I haven't changed my approach I've just found better ways to deal with difficult mm -hmm. cases like this um, and then we can move on to um, another one so 
I, I see a lot of patients from abroad. These are and, some interesting veneers on these. Yeah, you can see. <laughs> um, and a lot of them have these Hollywood smiles, they call them. Um, anything but Hollywood. And yeah, it, again, in this case, I, I saw that it was deep. So lasered everything, made sure I had access to tooth. And then, as I said, nowadays, I, I probably wouldn't do all of this. But at the time, pack the Teflon in. Mm. That will give you hemostasis. Like, the best thing for hemostasis is Teflon, in my opinion. And then remove all the decay before I get the dam on. The reason I do that is because, one, I don't want to contaminate the dam. I don't want anything to sort of stain my dam or get in the way. Because when I get to the bonding, that's the most critical part. So you don't want any bacteria, saliva, anything. Although you're washing and things, but I, I just like it to be clean. Mm -hmm. Build my wall up and then, again, just direct. See how damaged the gums are. Tell mm -hmm. the patient, yeah, it's going to be a bit sore, but salt water and time and it, and it, it will be fine. Um, and that's that. So John Marco has just popped in and just asked, would you now look at raising like a flat prior to isolating and things like that? So I think you're saying you're going to, yeah. you're going to yeah. go on now into what you're doing, what you're doing now. So like today's one, that interesting one, the stuff, I'm just going to cover that at some yes, point. So exactly. what, what, what have you now changed? So you're saying that that is that the main change that you've done? Is that instead of laser before laser? What yeah, sort of what's the. So laser laser is the first thing I go to if there's mm -hmm. no bone involved if i see it's close to bone or mm -hmm. it may need bone grafting then i'll just flap um it's much easier than to um control you don't have to then take the dam off or worry about oh crap i haven't done enough um prep there you can literally just take a burr remove the bone and get started with the next bit so it's all about planning it in advance so looking at the x-ray looking at the clinical um, situation and then deciding there and then okay I'm going to go surgical or I'm just going to go with a laser laser I would mm -hmm. do if it's if it's all gum if there is any risk of bone then I, I will blade and mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, Zubi's asking what Gemini. laser are you using Gemini, Gem oh, you're Gemini. reading it as oh you're a pro mate you're a pro yeah yeah the Gemini <laughs> it, uh, honestly that thing is an oh it's a game changer. Wow. Wow. It's so cool. It's so futuristic. It's like, it's a display which then just pops up with all these words and it talks to you and everything. It's amazing. But yeah. Oh, we've got something else popping in as well. Do you suture the flap before placing the dam or are you leaving that flap? No, I leave the flap open. I leave the flap open. Also, I don't do a full flap. So it's not, I'm not a surgeon like Emmy or these guys. I'm very conservative. So, again, for this morning's case, I might show it actually, but um, I oh, literally... You're just teasing that case. Yeah, yeah. I'm teasing <laughs> that case. Um, I, 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 went, I went across the seven and the six, and that was it. Like, it so was sort of envelope kind of like pillar and things yeah, like that. Literally, yeah. envelope you can imagine. Do, my, do the work that I need to do in the area I need to be in, clamp it on and then that's it then I, I, i'm not worried about suturing but yes i have sutured in the past where i'm sort of removing more or i'm extending the flap then yeah i will suture but it depends on the case if i can put pressure back on and i and the, the papillae grab together then I, I don't do anything so we were chatting on i can't remember which one it was or it might have been it might have been a podcast i feel like jazz was saying it I don't, it might have been one of his episodes actually, where he was actually saying that he was leaving, like they were leaving Papilla to allow it to act to help to hold matrices and things like that. So it's a, a bit of a, I guess if you go in that far down, you've got to get the bone gone. You need to get it. Yeah, yeah. Out of I, way. It's going to come down I, I to how far. I don't does it touch go. the Papilla. I don't. I, I keep the. I maintain the Papilla. I don't um, um, cut the Papilla or anything. I actually go around it. Mm -hmm. I peel it back, and then. I'll do my bone contouring, and then mm -hmm. I'll put the I'll put the clamp on. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'll keep the I'll keep the I'll keep the papilla. Um, what was I talking about? I'll peel the papilla, put the clamp on, and then yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
and, yeah. and yeah, Jamarco straight on it. You leave the pillar in place. It's like reading yeah, on the yeah. mind. It's yeah, reading on the mind. I don't touch the papilla. Even if it's posterior, you don't want to damage the papilla because that's going to give you the, the aesthetics um, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Even that posterior, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Hang in. <laughs> I don't want to uh, ask what is, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> And then one of the other things someone was asking, and you sort of touched on it a bit earlier about uh, sort of your NHS time and things like that, is composite heaters and sandblasters. I th and I think the wording itself was actually, are they worth buying? Yeah, yes, 100%. So uh, sandblasters, um, you can go for a very inexpensive one, and it will do the same, not the same, but it will give you what you need it for. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a must for adhesive dentistry. I think to do good adhesive dentistry, you need a sandblaster. Um, you need it for bonding. You need it for removing caries. You need it for prepping porcelain or if you want to touch up a repair or something like that. If you had a chipped composite or you, you have a chipped porcelain, you need to have a sandblaster to reactivate or etch these things and, and mm -hmm. increase the surface area, things like that. But I use it for so many things like people will tell me on courses that they're stressed out that sometimes they have to send back their crowns or veneers so that their lab can sandblast them for them. And I'm like, just have a sandblaster. Like, yeah, yeah. So it, it's just, yeah. As for Especially when the lab charges you 28 quid to do it and you're like, really? You're doing... Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Wow, they'll, wow. They'll, they'll, they'll charge a lot to do it. And yeah, as you say, you don't have to spend, you know, I think we've got, cavo ones that get you know attach into our chair and things like that but you know you can get yeah. those ones off um amazon or whatever and it's yeah you know, by the time you've done that you can get them for what 100 quid or something you know it's like you only need to re-cement three resin on the bridges and it's this gonna it. it's gonna pay for itself this is it, this is it. And, and and this is it this is what i tell people you know you don't have to, i mean i'm fortunate in every place i, I work in i have an aqua chair mm -hmm. you don't have, to have the rolls royce of sandblasters you know not everyone drives a rolls royce but it's nice to have if you have it. And then uh, what well, someone's recommend heaters. recommendations for it. For the sandblasters. So you're using the Aquacare. Yeah. That that does everything, you know, like mm -hmm. you can have different powders, different um the water smells lovely. Um, you know, you can use the silk powder for desensitization. Um it's just it's a nice bit of kit, you know. Mm -hmm. it's a luxury it is a luxury but who doesn't like that sort of stuff yeah and if and if you use it as much as as you do i'm assuming you're going to use it pretty much every yeah, content all, where you're using exactly it. so it's the always final, final cavity prep yeah. and yeah. yeah um and then composite heaters this is where i'm a bit so i i managed to find find a um this is controversial but i found a very good coffee tea warmer which mm -hmm, mm -hmm has not let me down in three years. Um, composite heaters, because they're dental or they're dental related, then they start adding 100 times more. I think if you've got something that you trust and something that you know will give you the degrees that you want it to, and we usually recommend 60 degrees for composites, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nothing more um, because you don't want bubbling and all that, but if it's consistently giving you 60 degrees or 55 degrees, then it doesn't need to say whatever and cost 500 pounds so that mm -hmm. it does the job. Because as I say, my one cost me 30 pounds and I've still, I'll still use it today. Still do, you know what it, what it, do you know what it's called? Yeah, it's called the Kasori. Oh, they, that, is that, that's one Jazz uses now. Now, I think. Yeah, they're 70 pounds now because literally everyone who I talk to, I recommend it to. <laughs> so the, there's been an influx of purchases from dentists. <laughs> is this on like Smilefast? Is this what you're talking yeah, about? Smilefast? Yeah, Smilefast as well. We, we, we basically just bought everything on in, in Amazon. Mm, That's mm. probably what jacked the price up. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, use what you want to use. You know, use what you can afford. And um, the research shows that heating composite improves the monomer conversion. It's easier to handle. If you're cementing with it, it's going to be better because you make uh, your your composite flow. But um, there's something new on the market which is going to solve a lot of that problem, which is the vibrating instrument okay. from Smile Line. 
Um, so it's literally a flat plastic, um, your composite uh, packer and all of that. You just change the ends. Mm -hmm. But whilst you're using it, it has these vibrations and the vibrations allow your composite to become um, more, more flexible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm looking not forward to it. feel really weird to use. I, I haven't used it yet, so I don't know. But I'm looking forward to it. Have a little trial with it. Yeah. Um, so I was just asking about the, well, they want, they want to know all the info about the coffee heater. Is it just like a hot plate or is it, have you got to have like a second part of it, like with a, with a mug what, sort of thing? It's all right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a coffee warmer. I'll, I'll see if I can find it up on, um, I, I've actually got one here. Hold on. I'm still in practice. Yeah. Here it is. I was going to begin a behind the scenes of Harrow on the Hill. Here we go. So look, turn it on. It looks fancy as well. Put the composite on here. I've got this nice orange dome which fits perfectly and it will keep going to 60. And then I know it's definitely 60. Mm -hmm. And I, this is what I use. I've also it's got just, a like, literally like a hot plate and it just warms up. That's it. Yeah, it's safe, it's clean, it's easy to clean because it's stainless steel. Uh, so wipe it down. It's never caused me any issues. I really love this thing. So that's why and uh, bit of tooth fairy says it's actually a good coffee warmer too if you drink your coffee. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I don't know. You don't have any composites to today to have a coffee. That reason. <laughs> <laughs> and then whilst we're talking kit, um, we had a couple of questions about about the laser. So you know, are, are there any courses about the Gemini? Is there you know, tra is there training involved with it, or is there sort of stuff yeah. you'd recommend doing? Yeah, so with the lasers, uh, I actually did quick lays with um, Anoop Mani RLP, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and uh, amazing clinician, amazing lecturer, and he opened my eyes up to the um, laser world, basically. But then um, through my Style Italiano link, I, I managed to find out about the Gemini, and um, I don't think they're sold as readily in the UK mm -hmm. as the quick lays, but you can inquire to get them. So mine was shipped from California, I think it was, where we had to order it. It's not cheap though, but yeah. But again, if, you, if you're using it enough, and it's probably one of those things where when you start using it, you find loads more situations that yeah. you can use it for. And Yeah, it's, it's something that, so like the sand blaster, it's something that's just ready to, to to work you know every day when i go to practice i set my camera up i make sure the sand blast is kitted all the attachments are ready and the gemini is charged that's it like it's easy you don't need to make a comp it's a complicated job so don't make it any harder than it already is yeah yeah exactly have you got orange okay. dome is from smile fast uh, um, there we go. i don't know where they get it from but <laughs> Probably Amazon as well. With the, with no, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I tried. Branched out. Yeah. Be, well, whilst we're sort of on that thing where you said you've got that, obviously your, your camera, is there any other like kit that maybe people aren't using that you think you're using day in, day out, that's a simple piece of kit to have that makes a big difference? You know, you, you know what? Again, I, I don't want to sound biased, but I think everyone should have an LMRTE kit. Um, mm -hmm. that has got five essential bits of kit that you will literally use every single day. And one of the best bits of kit in that kit, I don't know if it's separate now, or if, if, if it's in the kit, but the posterior masora, which is the one that has like the fork. Mm -hmm. I'll see if I've got a picture of it. But that will just change your game. I know there was a question about how do we make sure the occlusal heights or we don't have to adjust a lot after mm -hmm. placing quadrants and stuff. That's one of the main things that help you avoid um, any occlusal adjustments, especially at the marginal ridge. Um, game changer. AJ Dentry says a Spotify login. <laughs> a Spotify account. <laughs> So it's always someone else's Spotify account, isn't it? It's always the way. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll so I, I, that with I, you I, later. I didn't, uh, I didn't see that uh, that question. So was that sent through to you about the posterior quadrant stuff? So yeah, yeah. So I, I guess that you know you put, you're putting the dam on. You've got a quadrant isolated. 
So I've, I've just got another case here to, mm -hmm. to share uh, about that. So again, this is one of my older cases, um, I think about three years ago or two years ago. But this is typically, you know, uh, where old amalgams, worn um, composites. Um, what I do, if you look here, you can see I took a pre-op bite mm -hmm. with articulating paper. That is really useful when you're doing quadrants or even when you're doing single T because if you can see where the patient's existing contacts are, you can then see where to avoid adding material or check at the end if you've maintained this or changed things. Mm -hmm. So my workflow is always the same. I do that. I, I, I pre-wedge, put my, um, my dam on pre-wedge, take everything out, unless it's subgingival or I know that I'm going to go into trouble with gums. And then clean, selective etch, and start building up. Uh, in, this, in this technique, I was using... Um, uh, I can't remember his name now. But anyways, someone I saw um, on a conference, and he used to sort of put a layer of composite first and then put the dots where he wants his cusps and then he would sort of connect the dots, essentially. Map, map the fissure plan out, isn't it? Sort of yeah, things. basically, yeah. And then you see here on the occlusal check, I've got quite a high bit on the eight, mm -hmm. but all the others, they're pretty well maintained. But obviously, because this was quite high, you, we didn't get a lot of articulating paper contact but you can just about see it mm -hmm. and that was after adjustment so it does work um when you're doing these areas here this is the key to using the posterior misora so if you can get this area here right so the marginal ridges then the rest is easy the other tip i usually um, advise is look at the angulation of your cusps if you're overbuilding or if you're adding material above your cusps, you're obviously going to have a high point. So let the anatomy direct you or the existing anatomy direct you. Um, and that will, again, hopefully avoid you having to do a lot of adjustment. Um, do, you have, do you have any particular order in terms of cusps? Are you doing sort of like one angle, one angle, one angle? Uh, or are you sort of... Do you have any particular way of doing it? I was thinking this the other day. I was doing some just like clues on pre molars and it's sort of like you know, are you building, building in certain directions so you know your final, you know, layer is going to be on sort of one cusp? Do you have a, a set pattern like that, or do you mm -hmm. just? It, it's case dependent. Yeah, it goes. yeah, yeah, it's case dependent. So um, it depends what I'm doing. It depends what material I'm using. It depends how big the restoration is. Um, I, I will I will usually look at what I've got left and then I'll see uh, which part of the tooth I can recreate most sort of predictably. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I've sort of done all the easy bits that I know will fit, I will work on the hard bits because then I'll have better uh, proportions and things like that. So mm -hmm. it, it just depends on the case but it's like putting a puzzle together you don't go for the middle bit straight away you put all the edges out out first because they're the easiest parts and then you check which edge fits the next edge and until you get to the more complex and what you'll find is if you do it that way you'll be left with a very easy cusp or a very easy pattern there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's probably my advice but it depends on the case um there's no real, oh, I'll start with mesial buckle or I'll start with distal lingual. It just depends on what's there and what's easiest for me then at the end of the, of the treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. I don't know if anyone else has got any other, any other questions coming in. Um, well, as you said, you said there about depending on materials and things like that. So have you got sort of a go-to composite or have you, you know, for various situations? Any particular? Yeah. So for posteriors, I, I use the Optident Posterior Composite a lot of the time. 
And I also like the 3M, um, again, controversial, any biomimetics people, just close your ears right now. I, I like <laughs> the bulk um, by 3M. But when I say bulk, I don't just fill up in bulk and cure. That's not what I do. So there is a technique for using bulk to make sure that you're catering for C factors and polymerization shrinkage and things like that. It's not how it sounds. So most people think, oh, bulk, let's just fill up the cavity and cure it. That's not how bulk works. And that's not how the companies have made it. For. But what they've made it easy for is that you can fill up three millimeters rather than doing 100, 0.1 millimeter. Like, I, I like everyday dentistry, realistic dentistry, you know. Um, it's not possible to sit there and add 100 bits of composite to fill up two millimeters. It's just not feasible. And I don't know what the research, I remember the research wasn't in favor of it anyway. It didn't make much of a difference. Um, there are tricks to uh, cater for C-factor and polymerization shrinkage, yes. And I'm not saying that we should fill up six millimeter cavities and cure them at once that's not what we do but you can use bulk fill to do increments you can use bulk fill to do uh, cusp by cusp you can use bulk fill after using flowable so that's another thing i use i use a good high filler content flowable my favorite is the majesty aesthetic flow um i get through tubes and tubes of that <laughs> Um, but I use it for IDS. I use it for cementing veneers. Um, again, something I learned um, two and a half years ago from my mentor, uh, Walter Devoto, is he asked me a question about heating composites for veneer cementation. And I was like, yeah, because composites are stronger, this and that. And he was like, but why don't you just use a flowable, a good flowable? And I thought about it, I was like, why don't I use a good flowable? Mm. Is it because I want to look fancy and heat the composite and have this squish moment? Yeah, that's probably fine. Because <laughs> you got the heater on the side. <laughs> Sorry? Because you got the heater on the side. You yeah, but it, it makes <laughs> no sense. Like, what advantage are you getting from using a paste composite, which is 82% filler, versus a flowable, which is 79% filler? It yeah. makes yeah. zero difference. You know, and uh, yeah, it's just things like that where I now think about why am I doing this? Is it for the benefit of the patient or is it for my inner ego? Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's, it's for our inner ego and we have to worry about the patient before our ego, basically. So I've changed quite a lot of my approach to dentistry as I age. <laughs> So, yeah, we've had a couple of questions about fissures, but um, Amir's just asked about saving the video. So, yeah, it will be available on uh, Instagram TV in the series of all of them. So that's fine. Um, so uh, we had the first one saying, how do you make the fissures pop like that? So I'm sure we're talking about that quadrant case. Are you carving them in really shallow? Or are you doing sort of deep carve and then sealing it? Um, and then we also had, are you tending to do most of the fissure anatomy before setting the composite and a little bit of polishing? Or are you doing most of it post-cure, sort of carving it with fine drills and things like that? Uh, good question. Um, so, again, before... And Zainab just says flames. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Zainab. Um, so, again, this, uh, be before, I, before I did the, my, the, the composite course, um, I used to build up and then take a burr and cut my cusps and whatnot that's again not feasible it, it doesn't work it doesn't look great and it's just a nightmare so what i do again it's, it's case dependent if i've got a really deep cavity the first thing i want to concentrate on before i concentrate on fissures or cusps i want to concentrate on my seal i want to make sure my distal or mesial or both those mm -hmm. margins are sealed perfectly um so my isolation has to be on point. My um, enamel um, removal has to be right. I can't have overhangs or um, undermined enamel. All of these basics. So what I want people to really think about is don't get excited by the final. 
bit, you need to get the basics perfected, perfected. So there's no point in having a beautiful looking tooth if it's leaking mesially or distally or underneath. There's no point in having a clusal anatomy that's just amazing, but my margin, my marginal ridge is, is seeping through. These are the fundamentals. We have to get good, basic, adhesive dentistry protocols on lock, and then we can worry about fissures and whatnot. But again, if it's an occlusal which is shallow, um, I will use the uh, fast modeling technique, which is where I'll seal my base, and then I'll use a bulk or my posterior composite. I'll, I'll pack it into the cavity, and then I'll use the um, gray Elamate, the condenser, or now they've got a dark gray one for posteriors, which is called the posterior solo. And I'll condense it and I'll follow the angulation of each tooth or each cusp on the tooth. So I'll just put this in charge. Once I've removed all the excess, so I'm following cusp at a time, packing in the composite follow the cusp, pack in the composite, remove the excess, you'll end up with like little valleys of the shape or the form of what, you, what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then use the other side or the green fissura and just put a, um, a, a hole in the middle of where you want to start. And then it's literally just connecting the dots. So you can... When you're doing that, though, what you need to do is you need to make sure you go all the way down to the base of your cavity and then basically form your fissures. Then you take a micro brush. I just use a micro brush or you can use the composite brushes as well. And then just push back the mm. composite into the fissures again because you're going to open up the, the gap. That reduces your polymerization shrinkage because you're cutting the composite. And that will give you your nice fissures. Once I've done that, I'll cure. And then I like to use a flow ball again. I'll put flow ball on the tip of my fissure, uh, my fissura, sorry. And I'll drop it into the deepest part of the fissures. Then I'll use, if I'm using a tint, I'll get a tint, put it again into the deepest part. And I'll roll it against the, 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 the fissures. By putting the flow ball in first, you're creating sort of a carrier that's going to carry your um, stain mm. across the fissures. So you're almost doing like a fissure sealant, aren't you? The same way you it's put like it. It's like a fissure sealant. sealant. It yeah. is. And, and I just want to add something to that. So the reason we stain or the reason we add characteristics within teeth isn't so that it looks good on Instagram. Yeah, that's one thing. But it's actually to seal the composite underneath because when you're doing cusp by cusp or when you're doing it with the fast modeling technique, you will have tiny discrepancies between those fissures that you can't mm -hmm. see. So you need to seal those in. And that's why we do the fissures tinting, not because it looks good. It's because I want to seal it. So if the patient doesn't want tinting, I'll still use Majesty Flow to, to seal those areas in. Mm -hmm. um, and then cure it with, um, cure it, then put glycerine or, um, sealing gel which can be ky jelly mm -hmm. and seal it again um and then polish but yeah that's how so that, that was while we're on the glycerin that was one of the questions that came up which is thoughts on glycerin for the final cure so Definitely. That every time every step 100 percent. whatever composite you're doing whether it's cementing veneers or doing direct you need to seal your composite there is a microscopic layer of uncured composite under every restoration if you do not seal it with a sealing gel and it doesn't have to be again a dentally posh one you can buy ky jelly but please again guys if you are buying ky jelly don't take out a tube of ky jelly in front of your patient or ask your nurse for <laughs> ky jelly in front of your patient that doesn't look good just fill up the the etchant um syringes with mm -hmm. ky jelly and just call it sealing gel put it in your drawer and you've always got some, or glycerine, but you have to cure it. Um, so a lot of people will message me saying, oh, my composites have stained, or patients come back and it's like yellow, whatever. It's because they haven't got rid of the oxygen inhibition layer. Um, 
it, it, even you can check it yourselves. So cure some composite and cure it for as long as you want. Take a really sharp instrument and scratch it and you'll see little bits of composite coming off. And that's because that's uncured composite. You don't want to leave it there. You have to cure it. Hmm. Um, whilst talking about the ceilings and the stains and things like that, tints, so we've had recommendations on those. Uh, any particular brands of tints and stains and things like that that you use? Um, I use Toki Armour's colour um, and um, Empress do some good ones. Um, but I've used Tokiyama for a while. Um, not a problem. They, they've got high resin filler content as well. They've got high filler content as well. But they're not. They're not the. As I said, they're not something we need to concentrate on a lot because they're just the final thing. You can just mm -hmm. use verbal. Just verbal. Yeah, but as you say, the main thing actually making sure that you're sealing it to make sure. Yeah. That yeah. Um, a couple of people asking about, you mentioned the composite course that you did. Um, so someone mm -hmm. said, what was that composite course? And the other question was, how soon after graduating would you recommend someone going on a good composite course like a Steel Italiano? Um, and was was it Steel that it was that you did, was it? Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I, I did Style Italiano um, daily menu, their course. Uh, it was two and a half years after post-grad. Uh, what what I would advise is whether it's Star Italiano or whatever, do them as early as possible. Um, I felt that in VT we were quite suppressed by the training program because they used to tell us about their training days and whatever. And I think that depended a lot on where you were, whether you got good training or whether it was just, you know, to get through the training. So I didn't feel that I learned a lot in my VT from my training days, but I'd wish that I did courses like Style Italiano earlier on in my career, because mm -hmm. as soon as I did that course, I realized how rubbish my dentistry was. Not because they put you down or they undermine you. I actually, just it opened my eyes up to all these things that we're talking about. Why am I doing this when I can just do it this way? Why am I doing this when I can do it? Like, for example, I used to spend two, two, three hours on a case to try and make it look like a tooth. And at the end, it looked horrible. And then I went to Style Italiano and they showed me how to do it within an hour. And it looked amazing. I was like, what? So it, just, it was eye-opening. And um, it was also grounding because you realize what you don't know when mm. someone tells you um, something else. Yeah. So I, I just did their courses, actually. I haven't done any other courses. I've done the Smile Fast one, but I, I'm also now a lecturer on that. Um, and you've so got I, something coming up with Star Italiano as well, right? I saw you did the, you're doing something with Star Italiano as well, aren't you? In oh, yeah, soon. A webinar. We've, okay. we've got a webinar coming up um, on the 22nd. Uh, that's going to be with two unbelievable dentists um, from Iraq. Mm -hmm. Their work, if you think I'm good, trust me, I'm rubbish. Well, your other boss says you're the king of quads, so uh, there must be something if you think that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Oh, is that Ahmed? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. No, honestly, th these guys are really, like, talented, but... Um, and yeah, it's up, up to then next next week. Twenty uh, second, yeah, twenty second. So what, what's, that, that's what, going to be all the tri tips and tip, uh, tips and tricks on composite posteriors, um, how to work smarter, not harder, um, the difference between fast modeling technique and then doing it, going all out. Basically, you, you'll just see cases that will blow your mind, but at the same time, we'll show you how to do cases that look amazing with very little time um as well so that's coming up soon is that a webinar or hands-on that's a web that's a webinar and then hopefully if, if all the things go well with covid there'll be the conference in bulgaria and sofia in october oh, wow. um, where there'll be lots of workshops and things in, included in 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 the conference so there'll be loads of lectures by all these big guys and then there'll be lots of workshops for posteriors anteriors and other things yeah so i'm looking forward to that oh, amazing that sounds like some exciting stuff um yeah.
I don't know if anyone else has got any other any other questions coming in. We've got what well, we've got nine minutes before we get kicked off. Um, someone's asked as well about composite for anterior anterior work. Do you use anything? Obviously, you're not, I'm hoping you're not using bulk fill on your anterior. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. So for anteriors, I I, I use, again it depends on the case. Um, if I'm doing something where it's like edge bonding or something that I need lots of strength, I'll use, um, I love 3M's Filtech. Um, mm, it's brilliant. Good. It's a bit tricky to polish, but once mm -hmm. you, once you get that, then it's, I think it's the best one for anteriors. Uh, Venus obviously does everything. Um, I, I think it's an underrated composite actually. Not many people mention it, but it's a beautiful composite. Um, Jack of all trades, really, if you want to be safe. Um, and then Empress uh, for the, like, sort of multiple units, or if I want really good gloss, uh, Empress by Overclaw. Those are my three go-to. I also like Tokiyama, actually. Um, Asteria, lovely composite. Handling is, wow. Any difference in instruments and things for that, or is the Alamati going to No, Alamati, that well? that's all. I, I'm simple. Just have a few, and that's it. Oh, Omnichroma. Okay. <laughs> um, Omnichroma, I did try it. Um, I did a few cases with it, actually. It, I'm like, I don't want to be like harsh on it. The problem with Omnichroma is the handling. So most of composites that I use, I, I heat. This one, I actually had to use an ice pack to keep cool because as soon as it got hot, it would slump. So I, I'm not really a fan. And sorry, Tokiyama guys. Um, I love you, but <laughs> not great, that one. Yeah. But any any particular things for, well, finishing and polishing? We didn't talk really posteriors either. Yeah. I know when, when I spoke with um, Stuart on posteriors, and I always wind him up because someone asked about his polishing on posteriors. I never polish my posteriors. So I ask him yeah. every single time in the comments. Yeah, same, same, same here, actually. Um, <laughs> You don't need to polish posteriors because the patient's going to polish them for you. But yeah. I, I, I like to remove some of the grit and things like that just so the patient doesn't feel that sort of roughness on a composite. So what I'll use, I'll just use the spirals. ASAPs are great. Um, the Eve's Diacom, really good. They've also got the actual posteriors for, um, for with the Eve's. So you can use the Eve Diacom um, posterior um finishing and that's it it's very simple you don't need to do a lot um just use the rough one first just to get all the sort of bulk of the roughness away and if you really want to gloss them or shine them you can use the fine one but yeah. it's again just keep it simple anterior stuff any any particular special things on your anterior polishing uh polishing anteriors um i use 831 um perio burr that's to remove any excess to do my texture I love that burr, uh, seriously, the best burr you can get. And then once I'm happy with the texture, again, I just keep it really simple. So soft flex discs to do the body, um, so the primary anatomy, so line angles, uh, remove excess of the facial surfaces, and then 831 for texture and anatomy. And then finally, I use the Eves, Dicom, red and beige, or I'll use the 3M spirals, rough and fine very simple the trick is to do it in circular motions rather than go up and down or side to side i find that if you use a circular motion with the disc um like karate kid wax on wax off it, it the shine you get and luster is really really good really really good um we've got a question pop in at this uh they're just saying what we're using to remove any like your bonds here, your flash and things like that that might be subgingival you know, you're getting scalpel yeah. blades out. Floss, yeah, floss. First of all, floss, because most of the time you floss and it will just come out. Mm -hmm. um, again, going back to the LMRTE kit, there, there is the um, the sickle scale. It's called the Excesso. It's the pink one. Amazingly sharp, brilliant at, like, you just run it around and it, it will pick up anything that, that you might have left over. I would just say to the patient, um, don't worry if you feel something sharp or if something feels like a tooth that sort of come out. It's usually just the bond. We can't see it sometimes and it will just floss out um, easily. But yeah, I do check with floss first. Um, 
and then the accessor all the way around. Uh, and usually I've not had many problems with that. Perfect. Doesn't look like we've got any, any last questions. So the last one that I'm asking everyone, yeah, is there one thing, and uh, you sort of covered it in that first case, I guess, but you know, is there one thing that you do now or you know now that you wish you knew in 2015, 16, when you were just starting out? What's the, what's the big change the simple change? Keep things simple. The more steps you add to your workflow, the more you're going to add voids, the more likely you are to make mistakes, the more stressed you're going to be, the more stressed your nurse is going to be, the more stressed your reception is going to be. So it, dentistry is a hard job, but we need to try and keep it as simple as we can. And um, a quote I always love to use is, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, da Vinci. It really is. Um, uh, just don't complicate it. Um, remember who you're doing it for. Remember there's a patient behind all of this. Like, yes, we want to have nice cases for our portfolio and for our, you know, social media and for our colleagues or whatever. But there's a time and place for these things. Um, and if, if there's an easy way of achieving the same result, then why would we go for the harder route? Again, this is something um, Walter Devoto taught me. He said, if you've got the wheel, there's no point going back and sort of trying to walk or go back to the Stone Ages. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just keep it simple. John Marcos, yeah, he's tried to squeeze in at the end there. Have a little what, what, does, what, does that, what does he mean by that? Do you like rebonding posteriors? Uh, I'm assuming oh, he's saying like like putting, doing a layer of bond at the end. I, th I, th I, th I, I think bond. you mean, well, he's saying same as sealing with flow ball. So I think he's saying, you know, oh, doing no, a layer no, of bond. No, 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 no. Please, guys, please, please, please do not use bond as a final layer for anteriors or posteriors because bond is heavily just resin. There's no filler. There is a little bit, but it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, I wouldn't use bond, no. And it, once it chips off, your composites are going to pick up all the stains. And it, no, I wouldn't do that. That's in second bond or optic bond of fell. For, for what? I guess for, for that, for the rebonding, the posteriors. No, I mean, opti bond FL is a brilliant bond. It's, it's got a lot of filler as well. It's quite a thick bond, but it, just use flowable. Why, why would you use bond? Bond is to bond and composites for composite. Just, as I said, keep it simple. Perfect. Okay. Right, I think we're going to get kicked off in a second, mate. Cheers for that. That was yeah. fantastic. No, um, sorry we, again for, for the delay uh, as well. Uh, sorry. All good. Um, if anyone has missed it, I know a couple of people asked. It is all going to be saved. It's going to go into the series of stuff, so you can find it on um, on Instagram TV on my page. And um, mate, I'm sure I'll see you soon round up on the Fulham yeah. Road. Tune in twenty second. All the tricks will be revealed on the twenty second. Have you, have you got a link for it and stuff like that? that uh, it'll find? be on the Optibond, Opti Dense. Opti Dense website. Um, that's where we really showcase a lot of the tips and tricks. I didn't want to give away too much because honestly, that's that's um, where we're going to show you how to make life simple and what things you can use for your daily practice. Hopefully. Yeah. Perfect. And we've and had Bill on the guys entire and... hour at four o'clock in the morning. That is some uh, <laughs> some commitment. Bill, Bill you legend. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.